Um, this year has been quite, I'd say, a seismic shift in just in, in everything from my work, my lifestyle, uh, my environment. And um, like most people, I think, who had the privilege to really reflect on their lives during the pandemic in 2020, I did that. And as a family, we decided we were going to move somewhere that was gonna give us a bit more more space and just more, you know, more kind of more, more freedom in the way that we wanted. So we envisioned like, we just envisioned a quiet town um, by the water and made that happen, made that happen in 2021. And a big part of that was also for me to have a studio for the first time um, living in the UK. And I think most artists can understand that sometimes that there's a difference in how in your, your space very much affects how you work. And being an artist is, is definitely like being an investigator and being an experimenter who will work with what they've got. So I was working fine in my spare room in a small flat and it did, you know, my works were smaller, were a little more controlled, but when we finally came out here, and now, now we live by the sea in, um, in Essex in the UK, and it's a lovely town called Southend-on-Sea. It just expanded the kind of material scope of my work and the scale of my work. And um, being by the sea always has an effect, of course, you know, like it's got, it's, but it doesn't, it's not like a sort of um, stereotypical effect of like, I started drawing a lot more water-based things. It would just, in some kind of like very like fluid way, it helped me expand my horizons, I suppose. In some ways I went back full circle. Um, one of my first shows for AI was on paper and like very large scale, wonderfully thick kind of 300 GSM paper that almost feels like leather when you work into it and you can soak it, you can play with it, you can pull it, tug it. And that's what I like. I like the kind of, um, um, I like how much tension you can apply on paper and it won't necessarily rip, like it, it will give way. And um, it's also, um, it's, just, it's just so forgiving for so many different uh, medium as well. And also just very like, I don't know, like I said, it's sort of, it's, it's like working with fabric because it is still, it's still cotton, you know, it's still cotton you're dealing with. Um, but what I love most about it is that you can soak it. So when you're using pigments and inks and things, there's certain things you, you can't do so much with primed canvas or primed linen or anything like that. And, um, and the collaging and all that, that. I got crafty this year and I think the, you know, kind of merging kind of craft with, you know, fine art is, has, is a wonderful marriage, I think, because you can start, um, you can start applying like very different forms of kind of expressive, um, how do you say, like expressive um, marks and expressive gestures and, and expand on that as well. So I, I just wanted to, I was going through my own mental and emotional shifts in the changes that was happening, in the changes I was seeing that others were experiencing. And so I just wanted to try out as much, I just looked at my studio, I was like, what else can I add to this? You know, what else can I use that I've got just sitting there? I mean, I used colored pencils when I could have used more watercolor. I just used everything that I had. Yeah, so this is this is one of the big ones. Um, so I've I'm enrolled to I'm enrolled in a postgraduate um, program in an institute in London uh, that focuses on the therapeutic arts. So it's a postgraduate degree that's going to basically um, qualify me as a psychotherapist. So it's a big change. It's a five year journey. Um, it's 
And what really triggered that for me is that in my whole life, painting, art making has always been about, it's always been about a sort of inner dialogue that, that is responding to the external worlds. And that's not just responding, but trying to actually communicate with the external world. Um, and sometimes it's also very much a kind of an, a, a solitude, an activity to which one just converses with themselves. So I never really quite had the words for that, of course, you know, as a sort of 20 something year old that was just creating for the sake of creating. But as I evolved and as I've, I've matured, I just, I've, I've focused less on, I have focused less on output in my art making, which is like the end result, the painting, the thing that needs to be hung on a wall. And I've focused more on the outcome and the process of art making, what that means to us and what that has always meant to us as far back as we've existed. And there is now a disconnect with people and art making. And, and in some ways the art world has played a part in that, in um, creating this separate industry, this separate kind of art factory of artists that has made most people feel like they can't be artists. And so I want to be able to bridge that gap. And I want to be able to show people that we are all artists, actually. We're born artists. And there's something about that inner innate talent that we can tap into in times of need and in times of relationship crisis, in times of, you know, mental health is a huge thing that's come out from the pandemic. And um, it all just sort of came into this aha moment where it's like, okay, I've got this talent, I can communicate, and I absolutely love academia as well. Um, I've got this great studio. So what, what can I do to like progress with this? And it just made sense. And I've actually been in art therapy myself this year. Um, I see a therapist um, fortnightly and it's just been incredible. I was producing art that I didn't, <clears throat> kind of didn't think I had it in me. No, I have to go to the to the psychotherapist studio. Mm -hmm. um, the the my my art psychotherapist will have all the tools and um, everything that I I need to for for the session. What's beautiful about it is sort of it's a dynamic thing. So she'll have she'll also have sand because um, art therapy is about all medium. It's all it's it can be the spoken word. It can be poetry. It can be theater. Uh, it can be three three D. She had clay, sand, like I said, um, and um, different materials. So you can have a session where you don't create at all. You can you can just have talk therapy if you wanted. It's a very integrative form of psychotherapy that allows in the creative um, uh, the creative kind of medium, but doesn't isn't restricted to it. In terms of I'm going to be anthropological, right? So in terms of like groups like in terms of culture, cultural activity that we all pursue in a day to day, we all have rituals and routines, whether we wanna admit it or not, there are certain things that we do, certain patterns of behavior that we find ourselves in when, when we're responding to situations, some negative, some positive. Um, and the way to try and reframe how one responds to things, if, if it's, if you want to kind of change if you want um, to improve how you re how you respond to crisis if you're anxious or you know there are ways to go in and to try and change those rituals change those patterns change the environment that you're in so you're intentionally recharging your space you're intentionally channeling um, experiences in a different way you know we do have control over how we respond to crisis or um, or uncertainty or fear, all the things that we're gonna feel on a regular basis. Painting is just one other thing that can be a ritualistic um, moment even in time that can shift your perspective. It's all in the mind really, but your body has to follow suit. And for me, I, um, so one of the, so I'm gonna get start getting a bit personal because this work is was very, very personal for me. I um, 
got pregnant in the beginning of this year and I lost the pregnancy. And um, it was an early miscarriage. And that was such a huge disappointment. And, you know, it definitely got me down for a while. And, but I decided to try and use my art. And this sounds really cheesy, but use my art to process this. And this time I opened my mind to signals, things, everything I was feeling, I became a receptor in a way that was gonna, I was gonna be the medium to which I was receiving all these, all sorts of feelings and all sorts of ideas and thoughts and, you know, fears and all that. But I, I turned them into these very pictorial paintings um, <clears throat> that had symbols of, lots of symbols of fertility in my work. Um, growth. There was one painting in particular um, with this large bird that, you know, I, uh, the flying over above the clouds, um, looking, seeking, um, and trying to kind of overcome. It's, I think it's called um, with battered wings. So I, I have a son and he obsesses over rocks and minerals and fossils. And him and I got into that together when he was as young as three years old. We have this extraordinary, extraordinary collection of these stones and rocks and fossils. Ammonite in particular is his favorite and shells. And this, you know, this is a beautiful thing. I have, I have this son already, you know, I had to, like, I focused on progeny. I focused on the love that I had for him and, you know, and look to a future I could have more children, you know, if that was the way um, to go. And so I brought in all these relics. So I have, I have paintings called Relics of My Child. And it's, again, you'll see symbols of Ammonites and they're very powerful symbols. Now, if you look, if you look back to, I didn't come up with these symbols. When you look back to in human history, swirls and spirals and certain patterns represent growth and represent a sort of unfurling to a higher higher rung um, in Eastern culture as well as Western culture. The Greeks and um, Buddhists sort of apply the same meaning to a lot of these symbols. And it's really powerful to internalize that for yourself. And I did that through my painting and there was um, very cathartic. It was, it was therapy, it was my therapy even when I went to the doctor's office and I had to get, this was after I lost um, the pregnancy and I had to go to a doctor's office for a checkup. The number that I took in the waiting line was 88. And, you know, if I was, you know, I wanted to, I want to imbue meaning in my life. This is why, this was my goal when I went through that loss. So I took 88 as my eternal return. It was this, Symbol. So I have an eight, I have that infinity sign in some of the paintings. Mm -hmm. And it's very, I think, um, it's very sim it's very symbolic of the pandemic, what we're all going through, the kind of repeat, you know, that cyclical, it just seems to never end. It just seems to come back. But there is something very powerful about dealing with that as well and understanding that things do come back, you know. Um, in to full circle and we have to go with that flow. So these are just you, some of the symbols I've got that I really like took it to my own personal level of, of understanding. It was so I think serendipitous to see your work when you were experimenting with your prints your, your natural prints, and you were looking at these old, old prayer, Catholic prayer cards. At around the same time, I was looking at religious iconography. I was doing a bit of research um, because if you're looking at cultural practices and symbols, I mean, you can't ignore theology and you can't ignore religion and you can't ignore, you know, all the stuff that comes from there in terms of ritual. And this year, like I said, I was going through, there's a lot of change. And when you are hopeful for things, you pray in your own way. And this doesn't have to be religious whatsoever. 
um, prayer does not have to be a religious activity. It's something we do when we desire things, when we forgive, when we, you know, so that painting in particular, so I don't plan my paintings at all, even though it looks like, oh my gosh, there's a central figure. I'd never thought I'm going to put a central figure in here. I always start with a sort of, I always start with kind of a haze, a bit of a hazy cloud of just very, uh, kind of going back to my abstract expressionist roots of just splashing painting around, having a feel for things, very tactile, very, very body led. And then I start seeing things and it's almost like, oh, I'm a medium here, you know? Um, I start seeing things either because I want to see them or because subconsciously I have seen them already. Um, and I started to see forms here um, against my usual tropes of, I always do these sort of quite, I wanted to always go with blooms and, and, um, and growth and um, flowers, because I have a garden now too. So a lot of the flowers in this are actually flowers I do have here, um, particularly in my fuchsia, which look like those, the bloom. Um, so I had that and then suddenly in the middle, suddenly this cave-like image started to appear. And I went straight to, um, I went straight to like this, um, the Virgin of Guadalupe. When I saw the cave, there was a shape that's a very standard shape. Um, all the Mexican prayer cards have it. And I could not get it out of my head. And I, I actually had like a debate, like, do I, do I do this? Do I put her face in it? Or do I just leave it and let people reimagine that that cave and think and decide for themselves? But I just I just went for it. It was so intuitive, and I just wanted to. So I just literally I just did her tiny face, and that's you know that's about it. And her hands, just a, sort of a smoky haze, and it still isn't necessarily the Virgin Mary. But you know, I think I did I did I did see it, and I so I don't want to deny that. It's just part of my heritage, you know, like I've, I've shown these paintings. I have art crits here with artists as well. And I showed this work in process. They're all, um, they're mostly British artists that I, I work with here, have the crit with. None of them saw a virgin, you know, none of them, they're not, they're not Catholic. You know, it's not their culture. They just saw a face. So that was very interesting to me. Again, we charge what we see. We, we, it's all based on what we know, what we've experienced. So I, um, I definitely wanted to, I wanted to represent uh, that, that moment I had when I suffered that loss. I suffered a loss, but I wanted to gain something from it. So it's that loss and gain um, kind of balance again. And I did find that moment when I, when I grabbed that number in the doctor's office of 88, I took that opportunity to stamp that moment with a kind of revelation, um, with a, a personal revelation of everything's gonna be okay, you know? Um, that this is, this is a powerful moment and I should relish it, shouldn't ignore it, um, shouldn't just sweep things under the carpet. That's, that's what we like to do, um, thinking that's how you get over something. But no, I wanted to give it space. And, you know, the number eight, the figure eight, the symbol of, of infinity is a very powerful thing. We use it everywhere. And, um, and like I said, it's been how we have all felt about the pandemic, where we just keep going back to the same thing every day it's like groundhog day it's never it doesn't it feels like it's never going to end so for me so that's why that eight's in there in it, it's sort of almost like encased in a circle right it's encased in a sphere that's just floating in nothingness so the black definitely was a final touch i was like this is this has to be in like almost in in something that's just like that the, the nothingness, you know, because that is how it feels, this infinity suspended in nothingness and in darkness. 
Um, now the darkness doesn't have to be a bad thing. You know, it's, it's not necessarily like good versus evil. That's not quite what I'm trying to depict, but I am trying to depict a certain suspension of, a, a suspension of, of, of time, you know? So it's sort of like a, a metaphysical thing, I feel like, um, rather than being negative, you know, it's just, this is happening, let's pay attention to it. Um, and this may happen in, in, in other moments in the future, we might come back to this again. It's the pinks and it's the, the hues in there. I am, um, this is a, actually, a, so this piece is like an extension from my last show. I did, my last show was called Apparition and it was about seeing things that you wanna see or not being sure about what you've just seen and trying to make sense of things. And, I, and comets were apparitions in the past when we had very little understanding of the skies. And um, you know the first sighting of, of comets were, gosh, I mean, I'm not a, like a historian or anything, but the first sighting of, of comets would bring people to think that they were like, um, portents of, of like, you know, that they were, there were signs of something to come, right? You know, like we all, we all tried to make sense of that in a way that could help us uh, resolve our own fears. You know, we, we came up with stuff, explanations of the natural world so that we felt powerful, like we had control over it, but we didn't. And soon enough, we realized that the same comments we were seeing were coming back again like the Halley's Comet come, they, comes back in full circle. What do you know? It's the same pattern that I'm, I'm trying to depict in my work that, you know, these things, they don't stand alone. There's, it's just part of the cyclical spiraling or energy of the world and the universe and us. And um, I absolutely had to depict another comet. And this time I did do it over waters that was definitely because I now live by the sea. I, I, that was a conscious choice to have almost like, um, is it Kosai, the Japanese artist who did the wave, the famous wave. I, I wanted to do something like that. Let's go big, I thought. Um, and I wanted the comet to sort of look like the sky, like a sunset, um, cause it's sort of like an apparition. Is it a comet or is it just something I'm seeing in the sky? So that, that's that symbolism of, Again, kind of hope, um, trying to make sense of your world, what, what it means, and the environment that I was in, really. So, and I wanted to go big on that one. <laughs> mm -hmm. I just have a clone of myself. She's like in the basement. <laughs> She's only allowed out to paint. Um, <laughs> no, it's, you know, it is absolutely routine. You're, you, you, like, you need that. If you're a busy parent, I have a job as well, a nine to five, Monday to Friday job, which I love, but I'm not gonna give it more energy than it, than it needs, which is nine to five. So I'm very strict with that work-life balance. And so, and on top of that, I've got, I need to spend time with my, my family. And I've got, like you said, I, I absolutely love the great outdoors. So we're hiking, we're cycling, we're in the water. What, but what I will always make sure there are, with my art, there's kind of two work streams that happen. There's one that's very natural. I'll, I'll, I'll pick up my sketchbook, my drawings, my pens, I can do that while I'm watching a film. You know, I can do that while I'm sat down, um, just doodling. And stuff happens from those doodles and they become the basis of a bigger, larger piece of work. So that's one work stream, very organic, very natural, doesn't need a routine. Um, but there's another work stream that does need a routine. And this is especially when I'm trying to establish a body, a coherent body of work that's based on an investigation of ideas that I want to like, grow and that is strict i i wake up early in the morning particularly when it's like deadline time when i know i've got to produce i don't have to log into my nine to five until till nine <laughs> so i will work in the morning and i um 
I do have a studio now as well, which is outside in the garden. I do like that separation. I like to be able to literally like put on my, my work face, my game face and work. And I listen to podcasts a lot. Um, if I'm not listening to podcasts, I will put on a lot of radio head. <laughs> I'm like a nineties child, um, but it does have to be quite instrumental music. I find um, I get into the groove and what, and, but I have set times. So early in the mornings, and then in the weekends, I will do again mornings. I never, and when I say never, it's almost 100%, uh, never work in the evenings. There's something about the lack of light, uh, artificial light, it just doesn't do it for me. Um, so the evenings is when I'll have maybe those organic moments of drawing or whatever, where you know it's, it's just doodling. But yeah, weekend mornings and weekday mornings, then I'll give myself breaks. I will like literally give myself two months off and you'll find, I'll find that I'm just reading. I'll do, be doing a lot of reading in those times, which will spark the ideas. And then I'm like, right, when I'm back in work mode, those ideas, I've got to like now actualize those in some way, shape or form. Okay. 